and Blaise Holmos, a professor of oncology at Montefiore Einstein Comprehensive Cancer Center in the Bronx, New York, where I serve as associate director for clinical science, and I also oversee the thoracic oncology program. You know, of course, squamous cell carcinoma is one of the major subtypes of non-small cell lung cancer. It's less common than adenocarcinoma, making up maybe 25 to 30 percent of all patients dependent on the patient population we serve. Uh, and typically, it originates from the epithelial cells of central airways. Uh, as a result, many times it presents with central, you know, sometimes bulky tumors, leading to a number of local problems potentially. It is also different from adenocarcinoma on the histological level. Um, different immunohistochemical stains nowadays can help differentiate the two, um, especially P63, P40, cytokeratin-5, or squamous cell immunohistochemical markers. And lastly, of course, the molecular biology is quite different. While with adenocarcinoma, we have all those actionable molecular subsets. In squamous cell lung cancer, while there's molecular subtypes, FGF4 alter alterations, NFE2L2 alterations, et cetera, they really haven't turned out to be actionable yet to Im impact clinical practice. Squamous cell lung cancer, of course, generally occurs in patients with a significant smoking history or, or some other occupational exposure. And as I mentioned, it tends to be a central tumor, many times presenting with local symptomatology due to bulky tumor, maybe invading the mediastinum, obstructing the airway, significant symptoms such as cough or chest pain, shortness of breath, Hemoptysis is quite common, and many times these tumors can cavitate, you know, make, making this even more significant, of course, leading to the contraindication of bevacizumab in upfront use uh, due to the high risk of hemoptysis. Uh, many times, you know, patients can present with hoarseness as well, re re related, for example, to recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy due to mediastinal involvement and many times recurrent chest infections related to central obstruction or those cavitating tumors that we mentioned can be part of the presentation. Um, also hypercalcemia, so perineoplastic syndrome is very common in patients with squamous cell lung cancer related to PTH RP uh, production. So in terms of prognosis, you know, just if you're considering advanced metastatic disease, uh, you know, without treatment, the prognosis, prognosis is not all that different. But nowadays, with all the treatment choices that we have developed, of course, we've seen a lot more progress in patients with non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer, thinking about all the targeted approaches that we can utilize. So overall, the prognosis tends to be better nowadays in a patient with non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer. At the same time, if a tumor does not have an actionable alteration, there's not that much of a difference, subtle differences in clinical studies. It's still very important, of course, to offer the optimal treatment for both subsets of patients to improve the outcomes as much as possible with the treatment choices we have, we have today and continue to invest into clinical research so we can improve the prognosis even further in the future. Now, of course, one key element in patients with squamous cell lung cancer can be that many times these occur in patients with potentially heavy smoking exposure from the past, leading to a number of comorbidities, and also you know, can occur quite frequently in patients who are elderly, maybe more frail, frail complicating treatment approaches and impacting prognosis from uh, that angle as well. Well, of course, we have many challenges treating any patient with an advanced cancer of any type, but in particular, patients with advanced squamous cell lung cancer uh, you know, tend to have issues with regards to just a, a very aggressive disease uh, that sometimes can be difficult to control. Local or systemic complications of that disease, we spoke about infections, we spoke about bleeding, spoke about hypercalcemia, of course, you know, significant weight loss, you know, frailty can result from metastatic disease. But also there's an issue that if typically do not find actionable alterations in these patients as a result, our treatment armamentarium is a little bit more limited, more narrow, and puts even more impetus on making sure that you know, whatever treatments we have be used optimally for improving outcomes of the patients that we face. 
And usually the clinical trial data that, that guides our treatment decisions is somewhat on the weaker side in, in patients with squamous cell lung cancer related to a number of different issues. There's a number of issues why we have less data in patients with uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. You know, number one, it's of course less common uh, than non-squamous uh, non-small cell lung cancer, lung, lung adenocarcinoma specifically. Also, there's been just a lot less excitement about all these molecularly targeted choices that have provided sort of an embarrassment of riches of options in patients with lung adenocarcinoma, as well as the very large spectrum of clinical trials that have been completed or are ongoing. Uh, so there's just a narrower path in a way for a smaller number of patients. And also the patients we could accrue to these clinical studies many times have potential comor comorbid conditions, or other issues you know, that might limit participation, such as poor performance status or potentially advanced age and frailty. And of course, clinical studies focusing on these very specific populations going forward will be very important so that we can match treatments to uh, real-world patient populations as well. So this is, of course, very important. Biomarker testing, guiding, treatment management is so important for us oncologists to, uh, you know, know and 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 implement. And uh, you know, and in non-small cell lung cancer, this is a critical aspect of upfront management. And what is absolutely clear is that pd one biomarker testing, immune biomarker testing to guide the optimal use of immunotherapy is an absolute must for all of our patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. And now with all the, you know, the information in the perioperative space and in the locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer space, in reality for all patients with a diagnosis of non-small cell lung cancer. So pd one IAC testing, TPS score testing is an absolute must. Now, much more challenging conversation is about targetable oncogen driver mutations, molecular testing, whether next-generation sequencing is needed for patients with squamous cell lung cancer as well. Of course, it's a must. We shouldn't start treatment in a patient with non-squamous lung cancer without completion of molecular testing. But it turns out that, although rarely, but in some patients with, with squamous cell lung cancer, some of these actionable alterations can occur. So I think it's very, very important to at least consider it strongly in patients with metastatic squamous cell lung cancer as well. And both the ESMO and the NCCN guidelines provide a framework of that conversation, of that consideration. At the very minimum, any patient uh, you know, with a higher likelihood of actionable alterations, and these tend to be the never smokers or light smokers or the younger patients with squamous cell lung cancer. Also, some guidelines suggest you know, patients where there's only a very small specimen. So maybe we're not so confident that this is not a mixed histology tumor. Um, could it be an adenosquamous as opposed to pure squamous cell carcinoma? So there's some guidelines as to how to use the patient profile to maximize uh, uh, the yield of molecular testing. But in reality, when we think about now the NCCN guidelines, uh, that have been uh, changed recently, they recommend that consideration for all patients with metastatic squamous cell lung cancer. Maybe it might not inform frontline decisions, but for the long-term treatment continuum, ensuring that patients do not have actionable alterations that might guide you at least to clinical trial options is so important. Um, I do not think that treatment in the frontline setting would need to be held up, delayed, you know, with that consideration, except for those unique patients, the never, never smokers, et cetera. But it's very important, again, to seriously consider in today's day and age, appropriate, uh, you know, testing for our patients on that level as well. And just to reiterate, certainly pdi one testing is an absolute must, and it really guides uh, our frontline decisions in, in uh, you know, great detail. Uh, fortunately, we've seen great advances just the last couple of years, you know, since the era of uh, um, systemic chemotherapy, um, you know, for patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. And for both non-squamous and squamous cell lung cancer, now the frontline treatment choices are biomarker-driven for squamous cell lung cancer, mainly driven by assessing pd one expression uh, through uh, immunistic chemistry, achieving uh, the tumor uh, TPS score. And with that score, we can identify the benefit of upfront immunotherapy 
And with a TPS score more than 50%, now we have excellent clinical studies with five-year outcomes to suggest that in those patients, generally speaking, single-agent immunotherapy, anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-1 therapy can be quite efficacious. And certainly uh, for now, there's no clear-cut evidence as to any added benefit of uh, chemotherapy to that, although as we might talk about it in a few minutes, certainly on an individual basis, uh, nuancing of treatment decisions can be made as to where maybe adding chemotherapy can be helpful. But for patients with pd one less than 50% uh, TPS score categories, certainly we've, we've again seen a series of clinical studies now maturing very nicely, four or five years of overall survival data to suggest that chemotherapy and immunotherapy up front, meaning doublet platinum-based chemotherapy and anti-PD-1, anti-PD-1 therapy up front, can improve the outcomes over chemotherapy, or, uh, chemotherapy alone. So we're now in an era that, you know, basically up front, all of our patients should be considered for immunotherapy. The discussion is, do we add chemotherapy to the immunotherapy, not the other way around? And that is definitely a new era. We're very glad that we're able to offer better choices uh, to our patients, for our patients, and we're hoping to continue to improve upon this new foundation. That is a very important uh, you know, consideration. And of course, we need to look at patient characteristics, you know, the patient's age, frailty, comorbidities, the patient's candidacy for upfront treatment. Is the patient a candidate for treatment at all? Hopefully, you know, the answer is yes. Then does the patient you know, have comorbidities that might make the patient a poor candidate, let's say for double chemotherapy? Or would the patient be a poor candidate for immunotherapy? And let's just speak about the latter for just a moment. Of course, patients with baseline autoimmune disease have a higher risk of uh, side effects, immune adverse events on immunotherapies. So that's a very, very significant consideration. And we're gathering more and more data that, yes, indeed, some of those patients can safely receive immunotherapy. Considering the severity of that, of, of that autoimmune, autoimmune disease, the potential risk of a flare of it, and also strong collaboration with our colleagues, subspecialty colleagues managing that autoimmune disease is very important. And with that, uh, many times uh, an appropriate attempt can be made to offer the benefit of immunotherapy while managing you know, these comorbidities. Uh, of course, patient preferences you know, come into play as well. And then data-driven and guideline-driven incorporation of immunotherapy or chemo, chemo immunotherapy approaches. And just to reiterate, of course, PDI1 TPS score is our best guide. High TPS score, more than 50%. Most guidelines would recommend single agent immunotherapy, anti-PD1, anti-PDI1 immunotherapy is very appropriate. In some patients, you know, maybe we should still consider adding chemotherapy. Many clinicians would say that a patient uh, who's a non-smoker, a patient who's very symptomatic with a large tumor burden, Maybe, maybe like immunotherapy alone will not be sufficient. Um, now, for patients with TPS score less than 50%, guidelines sometimes break it down into 1% to 49% and 0%. And while there's benefit of chemoimmunotherapy over chemotherapy alone in the, the, the large pool of patients, that benefit seems less in the TPS score zero patients. And there's emerging data that at least the consideration whether some of those patients could receive even more intense therapy with the addition of an anti-CTRA4 agent uh, could, could be a, you know, a conversation point and a reasonable consideration for some patients. Of course, with the added anti-CTRA4 agent, we're adding some toxicity as well to consider. And let me also highlight that there's some particular molecular subsets uh, you know, where there's poor outcome with uh, chemoimmunotherapy alone. And there's a lot of experimental approaches to try to identify ways to improve the outcomes for those. So this is a, a very important question, but it you know, can, can be a complicated one because in reality, these anti-PD-1, anti-PD-1 agents are not that different when we look at clinical trials data. So, so many clinicians feel that they are reasonably interchangeable. Now, of course, there's a lot of other issues that come into play though. 
first of all, access. Is, is the particular drug accessible in, in, in the particular country um, uh, at all? And secondly, you know, what is the cost of the agent? If there's some cost savings using agent one versus agent two, that can be a significant consideration. And lastly, but, you know, for the patient, maybe most importantly, convenience, you know, plays into this as well. The differences as to administration schedules of uh, uh, these drugs. And I have to say that these will also change over time. The different versions, subcutaneous versions are being developed. So there's a lot of nuancing as to, you know, which might be the best choice. But in reality, we're very fortunate that we have very strong data with a number of these agents suggesting similar improved outcomes, both in terms of single agent immunotherapy as well as combination regimens. So we have a number of excellent choices to pick from. Well, I might say in terms of recent advances, recent data, number one, you know, I think we have higher and higher confidence about the proper use of immunotherapy up front as we have more maturation of the data from all the pivotal studies. Last year, we've seen, you know, most of the five-year updates, you know, from all, the, all of these key studies, suggestive of dramatic treatment benefits in some patients, long-term durable benefits from immunotherapy. So we have high confidence, you know, managing our patients with these excellent agents. Number two, I think, you know, what we've seen last year is a little bit less excitement as to novel agents, you know, for patients with squamous cell lung cancer, just as a highlight, we've seen some antibody drug conjugate data at ESMO 2023 with you know, significant benefits from non-squamous, but potential detriment for squamous cell patients, which I think makes us, you know, make sure that we're using the current agents in the optimal manner uh, until until we have more exciting agents in the future from experimental studies to help help our patients out. And number three, I think we've also seen data just at ESMO 2023 focusing on the squamous cell subset, the topic of conversation today from the Empower studies, Empower Long 1 and Empower Long 3, both single agent immunotherapy with semiplimab as well as combination platinum-based doublet uh, with, with semiplimab for number one, uh, the TPS score high positive patient populations, the single agent immunotherapy demonstrating excellent outcomes and with Empower Lung 3 for the overall spectrum of patients uh, with the addition of semiplimab, similarly, excellent improvement over chemotherapy alone with hazard ratios in the 0, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 range, uh, uh, much improved response rates and durability of responses. So again, kind of uh, corroborating all the evidence that we have for proper integration of immunotherapy, uh, either single agent for TPS or high positive patients, or with chemotherapy for the larger spectrum of patients, improving the care of our patients with metastatic squamous cell lung cancer based on TPS or IHC testing and, and proper consideration of patient preferences, patient comorbidities, and guideline-driven uh, treatment choices.